Hey guys, and welcome back to NJ Education YouTube channel. In today's video, we're going to be discussing uh, how to get into Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL um, in uh, for 2022-2023 edition. So if you're looking at architecture, uh, sure thing you're going to be looking at Bartlett, so keep watching. <laughs> All right, uh, guys, well, we're very fortunate to be joined by my colleague, Grant. Uh, Grant, great to see you. Hello, good to meet you. Thanks, thanks for joining mm -hmm. us. Um, so um, Grant has um, uh, won a place on undergraduate program at Bartlett for, uh, well, for architecture at UCL, and also um, uh, stayed on and, you know, won another place to continue on the postgraduate program, because I think it's not automatic, right? You still have to... No, it's not guaranteed. You still have to apply, you still have to kind of go through the motions, but yeah, definitely makes it easier having the the undergrad under your belt. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, probably better than anyone to, you know, talk about uh, UCL architecture. So, um, you know, Bartlett is um, sort of considered one of the best architecture schools in the world. So what, you know, what makes it so special? It, it operates in a very different kind of way to a lot of the other schools. Um, every school will kind of have a focus they, they really hone in on. So places like Bath might be a bit more technical, kind of STEM orientated, you normally need kind of a physics or a math to get in. Um, the Bartlett is almost entirely portfolio based and it's kind of driven in your research. So you take on a topic and you really run with it for sometimes two years at a time. So you really get to like interrogate something quite well. Um, yeah, other schools you kind of do modules and they're kind of a bit more spaced out. So it's kind of having the freedom to explore what you're, you're really interested in. Okay. And look at Bartlett, you have what, 20, 25 applicants per place? Yeah, uh, right about. You know, it can mm -hmm. be super competitive. So how do you you know, how do you make an application that stands out? I think you have to, um, again, I think it helps to kind of know what you're interested in as you go. So that should be a part of your personal statement, a part of your portfolio when you're applying. Um, generally, you want to you want to already have like a workflow and style and how, you, how you're creative, you know, how you're making that content already. So as I was saying before, I, I kind of had a foundation year where I got to really develop my skills and I got to figure out what I was comfortable working with and what I wanted to push a little bit as I went on. Um, I think if you're going in, Without that, it kind of you can feel a little bit like you're not sure what you're doing, and that can kind of come across in the application. So I think, yeah, knowing what motivates you in architecture really, really does help. Okay, and what you know, what are some of the motions of the application? So I'm guessing you know, just like everyone, you start with UCAS application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, what goes in there? Yeah, so it starts off quite quite generic where you're doing your your personal statement through UCAS, and I think um, that, like with any other personal statement, you're really just explaining why you're interested in the topic and why you're interested in the school. And you um, can't you, you can't tailor it to Bartlett because it goes to five other. Exactly, yeah. So it depends on where you're applying. You can you can make it quite um, like art and design heavy if you're applying to schools that are you know really focusing on that. But again, places like Bath that, that put less of an onus on the on the portfolio that might not be so relevant. So you can tailor it to a degree, but you definitely can't be name dropping mm -hmm. the school at all. Um, so yeah, it starts a fairly fairly generic in that sense, and then you you know as you come on, you develop that. You start to put your portfolio together with the school in mind as well. So ideally, you'd be doing art and design topics anyway. So you'd be doing either art or a DT or something something mm -hmm. creative that you can really use to bulk out your portfolio. Um, and that will normally be like a 10 or 12 page document that you're starting to develop in the background, even though you submit it a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, you know, so, so, so you have the UGAT application form, you have the personal statement, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to kind of do the work, put in the work a year, two years before applying. Yep. That goes into personal statement, the reading, the, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of how you've engaged with the architecture. Mm -hmm. And then you have the portfolio. So, you know, we're going to do a separate video, uh, you, mm -hmm. you know, updated video about the portfolio, but just briefly, you know, what it is and kind of what goes in it. Yeah, so the portfolio and the personal statement should really be talking to each other all the time. They shouldn't be two different things at all. Um, so, so you should identify kind of what your interest in architecture is, so why you're passionate about it or what you find exciting about mm -hmm. architecture. Uh, and then that should come across in both documents. So your portfolio definitely doesn't have to be architectural. I think that's kind of the biggest misconception that should be drawing buildings or making something to do with the built environments. That's definitely not the case. You should be kind of exploring a range of skills and a range of media and just figuring out what you're comfortable working with and what you can, you know, push forward as you do it at university. Um, I think scale is something people miss out on quite a lot. So generally, architecture is quite big, and normally when you're doing a portfolio from your art level, uh, from your like A level or GCSE work, it will be quite small and sketchbook. I think the bigger you can get with it, the more exciting it can be in your, in your application. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have the you have the portfolio, mm -hmm. um, and I'm guessing the portfolio to Bartlett would be different to the portfolio you submit to Manchester or to Bath? Yeah, typically. Again, you can have kind of a, a template that you work with, so it won't change a huge amount, but you can definitely kind of chop and choose what you want to be sending off. So 
do a little bit of research from the school, I think, figure out what they what they like to prioritize. Some schools will be more digital, some will be more analog. Um, you know, you might want to work with video, you might want to work with um, big models, small models. So I think figure out what the school likes and then just change it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But definitely don't break the format of the, the portfolio. Once you've got that down, just really run with it. Okay, okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, just in terms of the, uh, you know, any just final word on the portfolio, any sp specific things that you should include in the Bartley portfolio that you shouldn't include in, in, in the others? Yeah, I think... Um, I, I think sticking with more analog stuff is normally quite good, just showing that you have an idea of you know, how to hand draw and an idea of scale is, is quite important. Whatever medium you're working with, just doing that in a really basic way is key. So you don't have to be very good at using computer even at this stage. I think having digital work is best avoided because that's something you learn as you're going on. It's mm -hmm. something you learn through the projects you do at university. Um, but yeah, just really basic drawing, modeling, that kind of thing can be really, really key at this stage, I think. Cool. All right, and um, in terms of um, so you've done you know you've done that. What else goes in there? I guess your predicted grades and your achieved. Yep. Grades? Exactly, yeah. Um, and I know a few schools definitely in this kind of post-COVID era change it a little bit. So I was reading on Bath today that they um, you don't necessarily even have to have an art and design background now to be applying as long as you can kind of show that you've been doing it on the side. Mm. So you, I think read the the exact requirements these days is really really key. Yeah. Um, and it might be a little bit different from what you'd expect or what it has been in the past. So. Yeah, just kind of keeping up that that art design on the side is really really important, even if you yeah. don't have a chance to do it full time at school. And of course, you know the last component of your Bartlett application will be the reference. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know many candidates almost not ignore it, but they they sort of assume that their teachers will just automatically, you know, spend a lot of time writing mm -hmm. them a reference. But you know, would you say it's important for the student to kind of be proactive when it comes to that process? Definitely, I think um, being proactive to make sure it does happen in time is a big one. Like you said. Teachers will always do their best to get it out there, but sometimes you need a, a gentle nudge to make sure it's all happening to the timetable that you're trying to apply within. Uh, and then secondly, just making sure that they're aware of you know the school that you're applying to. So the Bartlett's, again, has quite different requirements to Bath or to some other universities. Um, I think explaining that to them as they're writing the reference can be really key. So um, I think, I forget, do you get a chance to review it before it's sent, or is it all done? So, um, well, most, m most schools wouldn't, show it's done blinds uh, yeah, yeah it's done on blinds wouldn't show but actually legally every student applying in the uk has the right to view the reference okay. uh, and the predicted grades so the student can just telephone ucas um and by the way the number is on your screen now so you can every student uh, even if the teacher is not showing the reference you can telephone ucas and ask them to send you a copy of the reference and predicted grades so your whole file you know you have access to it uh, again mm -hmm. uh, teachers kind of keep it on the down low uh, but uh, you know I think it makes zero sense not to show the reference to the student because they can access it literally the day after the application went mm -hmm. in. Um, I'd agree with that then. I think um, in terms of being proactive, I think just making sure that it is relevant to the school you're applying to yeah. and as specific as it can be. Yeah, mm. and and also you know, good idea for architecture. You got you know, you should be doing a lot of stuff outside the classroom. You know, you don't have architecture as a subject at school. Mm -hmm. So yeah. informing your teachers what you've done outside of school so they can back up the stuff you're putting in your reference. Definitely, uh, yeah, in your yeah. personal statement. Mm. And I mean, a lot of firms will offer internships as well. So I think getting experience before you before you're submitting this is really, really key. Mm. Um, and if that can be in the personal statement and, and the reference, definitely. And, and do you feel it's realistic for a 17, 18 year old to, to get a, some sort of internship without, you know, without contacts in, a, in an architecture firm? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, depending on, on the economy and where we're at, it can be easier or harder depending on if firms do need the work. Um, you know, in a recession, it's a little bit harder because there's not a lot of building projects going mm -hmm. on. Um, but typically, there's always something that you can be doing just for a couple of weeks in summer, you know, paid, unpaid, it doesn't really matter. I think just getting your foot in the door and getting something on paper that you've done in the real world is really key. That's, that's all matters. Yeah. Great, great. Well, Grant, j just rounding up this video, any final tips to um, our viewers who, you know, who are hoping to get into Bartlett for architecture? Uh, you know, any final tips for them? Yeah, I think I think just be really confident with the applications. So like I said, even if you don't have the opportunity to be doing art and design full-time at school, um, doing it in any other time you can and really understanding what motivates you and what excites you and like the best medium for you to work with is really key. Um, the Bartlett, unlike a lot of other schools, will do a drawing task as well. I don't mm -hmm. think we talked about that, but there will be, you'll get a few drawings that you have to do within a, a limited time frame. I think that kind of thing can really catch you off guard if you're not really warmed up in how you're making work. Mm. So kind of doing it always in the background and being ready to, to kind of draw or make any time is keeping that fresh is really, really important. Interesting. Well. 
grant all you know really useful uh, guys don't forget about the drawing task uh, that you're gonna have to do under limited time uh, but for now uh, please join me in thanking grant uh, for joining us grant thank you thank you thank you much it was super useful uh, guys all the best to you please remember to subscribe to this YouTube channel uh, you know we put a lot of time into making these videos um, as useful for you as possible so if you could subscribe um, that would be massively appreciated um, and also uh, there is a newsletter that I write in university admissions. I send it every two weeks. It's packed with a lot of really useful stuff. I promise you're not going to be disappointed. And if you are disappointed, you can always unsubscribe. Um, but to subscribe, uh, go to the link below and you can do it with your email there. Uh, you'll hear from me once every two weeks. For now, all the best from us and good luck with the applications. Thank you.